Welcome to the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. I am your host, Alex Green, and I'm on a mission to bring the power of embodiment to people all around the world. In this podcast, we explore how embodiment practices, trauma healing, and knowledge about the human nervous system can help us find our ground, discover new sources of meaning, and create connection in an ever-changing world. The deepest change is embodied change. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am excited to be sitting down today with my guest, Kelly Allen Pickens. And uh, Kelly is a uh, family nurse practitioner based in Madison, Wisconsin. And we actually know each other from a former life in uh, Spring Green, Wisconsin. But we've connected again recently because of her uh, work with ADHD, a specialization of hers, uh, and a new private practice uh, that she has started in Madison called Undivided Attention with a uh, focus on specializing in diagnosis and treatment and management of uh, ADHD for um, women and girls. So um, uh, I, w- Kelly and I connected recently and just had a bit, just a bit of a conversation about the overlap of um, ADHD as a mental health diagnosis and some of the work that we do at Redbeard in term of, terms of nervous system regulation. And so that was kind of just the beginning of a conversation. And uh, I asked Kelly if she would join, uh, if she would come on the podcast, because to me, um, ADHD is something that I hear a lot about. It comes up in my own client work. Uh, in the past year, two of my friends or uh, colleagues have been have have gotten uh, diagnoses with ADHD, and they've done a lot of them um, explaining uh, to me about just why what that helped them understand about themselves. And so it's become uh, just an area that I'd like to know more about. Um, uh, and and Kelly is has done a very deep dive and and has a lot of expertise, um, both clinically and also firsthand as um, someone who received an adult diagnosis of ADHD pretty recently. So, um, Kelly, I really appreciate you joining the call and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, could we just sort of set the scene a little bit with you personally? Um, you know, you've been in practice as a nurse for a couple of decades, as a nurse practitioner for a few decades in family medicine. Um, how did this, uh, uh, how did uh, ADHD come on your radar and now become your focus? Yeah, um, ADHD was not on my radar really at all. Um, and I needed to do some continuing education and opened up the catalog and alphabetically listed adult ADHD was the first listing. And I thought to myself, gee, I wonder what, you know, what's the latest with adult ADHD? I mean, I thought I knew, I thought I knew something about it. Um, But as I was going through the program, I just really realized, A, I didn't know anything about adult ADHD and B, I had adult ADHD. (laughs) Um, Wait, how, how did you realize that? <laughs> well, just like as I was going through, I was like, oh, this is about me. Oh, this is this is my life. Oh, uh-huh. oh, uh-oh. <laughs> um, yeah. So many revelations that just kind of explained different challenges that I had had throughout my life. You know, for mm-hmm. instance, um, I've always been smart, but, um, you know, I avoided school in elementary school, I pretended to be sick a lot. Um, Mm. Mm. You know, my grades never suffered, but Mm. something about it, I didn't want to be there. Um, Mm. And then in middle school, I flunked algebra the first time because I just could not make myself do the homework. Mm. And homework was, you know, something like more than 50% of the grade. Right. And, um, and then, you know, things got harder, much harder in college when, you know, I grew up in a very structured household. Dinner was on the table at 5.30 p.m. every day, you know, mm. very, very predictable. I was in sports. Like, my life was scheduled and busy until mm. I went to college. And then I was on my own, and things just sort of started to fall apart. So it actually took me six years to finish finish my bachelor's in nursing because I, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, well, I didn't start in nursing, and then I flunked a year and had to go back and repeat all of that. And Mm. 
Um, but you know, knew da- deep down that I was a smart person and that I, sure. you know, could be a straight A student. And so hmm. when I went back for my master's, I was like, just absolutely driven to prove, to prove that I was a straight A student. I like and, it. Yeah. you know, it was much more, I was much more invested in it and it was much more interesting. And so I finished at the top of my class and, hmm. um, but then, you know, can't manage a budget. And like for the life of me, I, I can do math. I'm good at math, but you know my life has been a financial roller coaster of debt, mm. and you know, and then there's just the relationship issues, all kinds of things like that. Mm. And then there's the deep seated shame of you know I don't feel like I'm a good daughter because I don't remember to call. Um, Mm, mm. I don't remember birthdays or I didn't feel like I was a good partner because kind of same thing, like, Mm, mm. you know, say you're going to be at a certain place on a a certain time and Mm. late often, Mm. um, hard to focus at work. And like, as the structure in my life has sort of evolved, For instance, I went from, you know, having a desk that I had to be at, at, you know, 8.30, Monday through Friday, to being part of a mobile workforce and not having a desk anymore. Even just that started to just shift things for me. And Mm. um, yeah, so, and I, you know, had, I actually thought I had dementia and (laughs) Mm. sought neuropsych testing for that. And um you know, but I didn't know that impulsivity and like my inability to manage a budget and like too many mm. sexual partners in college and taking mm. the family car for a drive at age 14 had anything to do <laughs> with my memory. Ah, okay. okay. Um, and so, yeah, so that was um, a couple years, probably three years before I did that adult ADHD continuing education. I was like, Ding, 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 ding. Got it. Um, yeah. So that was kind of my journey. Interesting. So, so what were some, when you, when you did that, um, continuing ed class and you just sort of, you know, picked it cause you needed credits, but it was really speaking to you, to your experience. What, what were some of the, um, do you remember any of the, just the key things that were like, wow, that's, that's me. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, the very first thing that actually like just blew my mind open was the statistics about Mm. um, the outcomes for untreated ADHD. Mm. Um, I had no idea that ADHD untreated um, reduces life expectancy by 12 to 20 years. That's massive. And on par with diabetes, it's actually significantly worse than um, heart disease alone or smoking alone or alcoholism. Mm. Um, And so that like grabbed my attention right away. Like, holy cow, wait a minute. What? Why don't I know about this? Um, Right. Can I I ask a question about it? Because I saw that I was reading through the FAQs on your website, which is a really good resource, actually. Mm. Um, and, And I saw that and it stood out to me and I thought, wow. Um, what, uh, what's the mechanism there? Is that is, uh, mm-hmm. d- d- yeah. What, how, how does that work? Well, um, sadly we don't really know, um, very well because we okay. have not like as, as science been looking at ADHD in adults very, very much. Um, okay. it's been kind of ignored until maybe in the last decade or so. I mean, honestly, it's only been an official diagnosis for a decade, okay. Um, but so we don't for, actually for adult for adults, you mean for adults, right? I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the research is very, very, there's a huge paucity of research, but, um, one of the things that, um, is being pointed to would be just accidents, accidents in general, car accidents, you know, all mm. kinds of accidents would be probably okay. the number one cause, but okay. ADHD and, and this is not just like as from a lifestyle perspective, but from a genetics perspective is Mm. correlated with, um, there was a study done in Sweden in 2021 where they looked at, uh, I don't know, massive amounts of sibling pairs Mm. and, um, looked to see if there was a connection between ADHD. And I think it was 
20, I'm going to say like 26 um, medical dis conditions. So such as Parkinson's, um, celiac disease, um, high blood pressure, heart disease, um, mm -hmm. dementia, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you name it, all kinds mm -hmm. of like the top 20, you know, chronic conditions. Sure. And um, ADHD was correlated with all but one. Mm. Um, and the one being rheumatoid arthritis, but every other disease that they studied, there was a genetic mm. link 60 to 70% of the time. And so mm. we don't, we still don't, we haven't looked at like, okay, well, what's the interplay there? And mm. how does ADHD affect the management of those conditions and vice versa? And so there's so much we don't know. Um, mm. and yeah, I think, you know, Adult ADHD is having its moment, finally, thank goodness, mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. it, this is huge. Um, but yeah, um, what what's contributed to that? What 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 is it? Just that enough uh, research has come out, or what? What are some of the factors? Because I've seen that too. You know, it's more on my radar now than it was even five years ago. Right. Um, and I'm I'm wondering what's what's causing that. Um, well, I think it's um, quite a few things. Um, I would say in the last three years, it's um, a combination of, you know, kind of COVID sort of like pushing people completely over the edge. So people who had maybe been holding their life together by a thread, um, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, all external supports are removed overnight, mm -hmm. and finding that they just cannot function without it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, diagnoses, shot up okay. and so did prescribing and that brought a lot of attention but you know with with it being labeled a diagnosis in 2013 in the dsm-5 mm -hmm. there was you know more awareness and then several you know um really quite prominent authors published some pretty good books such as russell barkley um who is you know really kind of been the pioneer for mm -hmm. um, ADHD and adult ADHD, Ned Hallowell and, mm -hmm. and others. And, um, and then social media, I mean, social media just was, you know, people were able to find and, you know, relatable things to what they were experiencing. And then that just amplified it. And a lot of, a lot of people, particularly in conservative media, you will hear say that that's a trend, um, mm -hmm. that ADHD was a trend. And of course, like, you know, if you go to your doctor and you say, well, I saw this on TikTok, da, 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 right. Right, you know, right, that's right. going to kind of turn them off. But, right. but I, you know, it was just a combination of awareness, like just gaining momentum and, you know, now we have the internet and information flies, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think it was just sort of, you, you, uh, somewhere I saw, I, I, I think on your website, I think I saw you said something like, you know, um, um, you know, neuroscience research is, is often about 17 years, if I'm remembering correctly, That's right. ahead of, of clinical implementation in, in the, in standard medical models. I mean, that's so all research, that, not just neuroscience. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So research in general. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, right. so, and so I imagine that shows up within, within ADHD understanding and treatment as well. For sure. Um, yes. And like, yeah. if you think about it, we're only at like the halfway point there. So like if adult ADHD has clinically only been a diagnosis that, you know, anyone could, you know, anyone who's capable of um, diagnosing, diagnosing has been permitted right. to do it. We're only about, you know, 13 years in there, it probably takes more like 20, um, no, 10 years, 10 years. So we're half, uh -huh. we're at the halfway point. Halfway point. Yeah. Yeah. Of, you know, of like getting over the curve of like, okay, now most people, most healthcare practitioners understand ADHD. We're not recognizing you know, halfway it. there. Yeah. 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 I see. Yeah. What, what are, um, uh, what are some misconceptions about ADHD and, and adult ADHD? Well, uh, you know, ADHD has a terrible name. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, mm. is terrible um, because there's not a deficit of attention. Um, there's a deficit of an ability to regulate attention. 
Mm. And there's very rarely is there overt physical hyperactivity. There's almost always, even in people who have inattentive, you know, predominantly inattentive ADHD, there's mm. cognitive hyperactivity. Mm. So, mm. um, and so what that means is the inability to regulate your attention and have cognitive hyperactivity boils down to executive functioning problems, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people think, oh, you just can't pay attention and you're fidgety. No, it's what it really boils down to is a deficit of self-control. It's okay. a deficit of being able to, you know, follow through on your intentions. <laughs> a lot of I people see. will call it like intention deficit disorder because you have the best of intentions to do this or do that or don't do that. Okay. And but there's something between wanting and wishing and needing to do it and doing it or not doing I it. I see. I, I, I loved that quote. It was on your website from Russell Barkley, who you mentioned, and he said something like ADHD is not a disorder of knowing how to do things. It's a disorder of doing what you know. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? That's exactly right. So he kind of talks about there being like, um, literally like, so you store knowledge in the back of your brain. That's, that's mm. where knowledge happens. Um, okay. but you know, motor activity and motivation and acting on that knowledge happens in the front of the brain in the prefrontal cortex and in the motor cortex, which are right up I here. See. Yep, and the, yep. the, the brain develops, you know, from the back to the front because the back is more, um, responsible for, our survival, right? Autonomic function exactly. and survival. Yep. Yep. Right. Like we shouldn't yep. have to like think about whether or not the skillet was hot when we just put our hand on it, automatically mm -hmm. be able to pull away. Right. So, yep. Yep. um, but you know, as time goes on and we grow and develop and we have to be able to manage social interactions and, um, you know, plan for our, our long-term goals and things like that. That's right. when the prefrontal cortex starts to get engaged. And it's kind of like, you know, the, um, the CEO and there's mm -hmm. just a disconnect in people mm -hmm. with ADHD between getting that information that's at the back to the front and being able to act on it. I see. I see. Yeah. What, in terms of other misconceptions, like one thing that I, that I'm not even totally clear about myself is, um, you know, my understanding is my, my, what I think I understand is, is that there's a genetic component, um, or, or maybe even a strongly, strongly genetic factors, but I've seen, um, I, I you know, I've, I've seen like, um, Gabor Mate, for instance, who's, who's somebody who I really like and follow. And one of his earliest books, Scattered Minds, um, was in 1999. Now, given he was writing about children, but uh, and ADHD, but the, his basic premise was that was sort of twofold. One was, hey, maybe we're like just indiscriminately treating this with um, stimulants without without investigating are there other are there other components of treatment that might be helpful. A and B. His other sort of hypothesis was. Uh, you know, we're treating this as just this fixed, you know, uh, condition. Uh, could there be a role in childhood stress and trauma? And and I'm hoping that's an area, that last topic, I'm hoping you and I can cover um, later in this conversation. But, but okay. again, so, so, so um, do we know at this stage, the degree to which this is, a, you know, it's a genetic uh, in hereditary thing versus environmental factors or both? Yeah. Yes. Um... Well, we, you know, uh, let's see, um, three genes have been identified, the dopamine receptor four, dopamine receptor five, and um, the dopamine transporter gene. So three genes have been identified for sure. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. there are other genes with, you know, 12 other things with all the alleles. And I, you know, I am not a geneticist. I don't quite understand all of that, but. Me, ne me neither. <laughs> yep. Yep. But we, ha we do know, we do know that there are three genes involved for sure. And twin studies show an 80% concordance rate. Um, and Does that mean that if there's twins, 80% would both have it? Is that what you yes, mean? Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah. And yeah. that's huge. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there's epigenetics. 
right? So uh -huh. there's the influence of environment on genes. And so that's really what it's looking like. That's where the research is going to point more towards there are these genes, D4, D5, and the dopamine transporter gene. And mm -hmm. you have, you know, you have the allele or the phenotype or the whatever, and mm -hmm. something in the environment could be um, an exposure. Um, perhaps the mother smoked while pregnant or was, mm -hmm. um, ex mm -hmm. you know, the fetus was exposed to alcohol in, um, during gestation in yeah. or yeah. yes, or, um, you know, there could have been, you know, a mild anoxic event or something during birth or, yep medications you know we don't know what all of the environmental um toxins um are right. um right. but there does seem to be uh, the smoking the smoking interplay has been mm -hmm. pretty strongly um connected identified okay so hopefully that means the diagnosis of adhd like prevalence is going to go down because i think you know there's less our parents less generation smoking. yeah you know, smoking. Yeah, yeah, they smoked. And yeah. fewer people do now. But yeah, so that's, that's where the research is now. That's where the understanding is now. Um, in 1999, okay. I don't think we had as good of molecular genetic studies as we do now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, right. Maybe he's it, it, changed his stance. I <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I, yeah, you I want. It's a healthy yeah, approach, new information, yeah, I'll be, change your mind. <laughs> I'll, be curious, I, I'll be curious about it. I mean, one of his big themes, even in his most recent book, The Myth of the Normal, yeah. uh, which I'm plowing my, my way through, which I think is really good. And, and okay. you know, he's looking at um, the, um, he's look he's looking at the influence you know, sort of like the the pivotal Kaiser Permanente ACES ACES study sure. you know, was a long, longitudinal studies which showed that uh, adverse childhood experiences like um, you know uh, uh, having a parent incarcerated, divorce, uh, physical sexual abuse, um, uh, in uh, lack of safety in the home or the environment. You know, sort of these. Right. It's a score where you can be one, you know, zero through ten on the ACES evaluation. Right. Um, and, and that Kaiser Permanente study was sort of one of the er first to sh sort of show definitively that those kinds of adverse childhood traumas do very much play a role in in longer term health conditions, things right. like heart heart disease and autoimmune yes. disease and things like that. So that's been a big zone of um, of of work for Gabramati's work has been about yes. looking further and further at that, and so. Um, that's what, you know, the myth of normal is just sort of up to date stuff okay. around correlations yeah. of that. And I, I, I haven't gotten to a part on ADHD, so I don't know if he's, if he's going to broach it in, in this book, mm -hmm. but, but do you know, is that just in the ADHD world, you know, that you're now intimately involved in the, the leading edge um, of treatment and understanding the research, is there conversation around that? So you're mentioning sort of gestation, you know, epigenetic factors that might be turned on by, by stresses, chemical stresses and things like that in utero. But is there any, do people talk about adverse conditions, the ACEs? Does that come up at all? Well, I certainly look at the ACEs score. Um, I look at that yeah. on, on, in all my clients, partly because... So if you have ADHD, there's a good chance that at least one of your parents had ADHD. And mm -hmm. if, you know, because of, you know, we're all kind of the lost generation uh, because people didn't really understand adult ADHD. And so they right. may have grown up in a household where there was addiction, where there was, you know, impulsive behaviors and potential for abuse and, you know, a potential for incarceration. 40% of the prison population meets the criteria for ADHD, you know, so, so the risk for, you know, having a score that puts that person um, in the category of being at risk for toxic stress mm -hmm. um, to me is an important part of the evaluation because, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of like how it influences ADHD, I think it just means that 
we're looking at maybe a doubly dysregulated nervous system mm, that is dysregulated just from the executive functioning standpoint, which includes emotional dis- dysregulation. Right. But right, then right. you have the chronically activated sympathetic or parasympathetic. fight or flight nervous exactly. system or, or, or freeze physiology. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which I um, am doing a lot more research into myself. Um, I'm currently looking at, um, do you know, Janina Fisher? Oh and yeah. Her work with shame? So. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm working through her shame certification program to really kind of get a better understanding of that. Oh, myself. very cool. Nice. Oh, good. Yeah, maybe that can be a that might be a future conversation yes. if you're up to it. Yes, yeah. that would be yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, I mean the interplay is there and and people with ADHD, especially those who go their life undiagnosed, mm. you know, have a shame wound. They have yeah. a competence wound because they've been like told over and over again, like right. you you're not trying hard enough, you know, those kinds of things. Um yeah. so there's no way to separate it in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like it's all, it's one thing, you know? I mean, I do have clients who like, they have a zero on their aces, but they still have a pretty activated nervous system, (laughs) you know, Yeah. because of, because of that stuff, because of like, you know, having a teacher who, what like really didn't like them and, you know, thought that they could do better and, you know, criticized a lot. And, Right. You know, so those sorts of things. Yeah. No, I hear a lot of, you know, yeah. Education trauma, you know, people made to feel that they're, that, that, you know, they, they, they become ashamed to even try to contribute because they've been, they've That's been right. sort of put in a box of, of, um, you know, in various ways of not, not performing the prop, you know, not thinking in the right way and all that yes, sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I wonder if we could talk about your, you know, you were obviously, um, well, actually, I guess there's sort of two parts of this question. I mean, so you found out you, you know, you, you, you had this sort of epiphany that all of this was explanatory for you. And then I, I assume you, you know, you seem like a a researcher, you did a lot of learning. I have no doubt. Um, what, before you then started your practice, because obviously you're now passionate to help others, once you got diagnosed, what were some of the most helpful things? What changed for you besides sort of normalizing and understanding? Did you then pursue any uh, types of treatment, um, uh, you know, um, medicinal or otherwise? What, what, what did you do once you knew you, yeah, this applied yeah. to you? The very first thing I did was um, ADHD coaching. I worked with a coach um, for, I think it was six months. And yeah, I mean, that was the most helpful thing I had ever done, Um, you know, because Mm. as I had mentioned earlier, things started to fall apart for me, probably my sophomore year in college. And, Mm. you know, I just kind of kept saying, like, I'm not doing well and like going to like student, you know, the student counseling center and um, just never getting the right help, basically right. <laughs> never getting the right help for most of my adult life. And so, you know, I've been through all kinds of therapy and sure. I've tried lots of antidepressants through the years and, um, mm-hmm. ADHD coaching was more helpful than all of that combined. Um, what, what, what happens in ADHD coaching? Well, one of the most important things for ADHD is to really, people with ADHD is to really learn what ADHD is because Mm. it's such a complex disorder and it's so pervasive across every realm of your life, every aspect of everything you're trying to do, um, Mm. that it's happening all the time. Um, But you don't, you may not recognize that that's, oh, oh, you mean that's my ADHD that I can't, you know, I have to struggle to not finish people's sentences. Mm. I'm not just a, you know, an asshole for interrupting. That's ADHD. (laughs) What? Yeah. Um, yeah, Interesting. You know? Yeah. So it's a lot of just like learning really what is ADHD and then really like doing a lot of exercises, like very specific guided exercises to find out what your own personal rhythms are 
where your shame wounds are, you know, mm. what your strengths are, and then how to like really organize your life around your ADHD to support it. And there's a saying in the ADHD community, which is like, stop trying to be neurotypical. Mm. And it took me a good solid three years to really finally understand what that means, right. which is that like, no matter what skills you learn, no matter what you learn about your ADHD, no matter what medications you take, you still have ADHD. Mm. You mm. will not, we, there's no, there's no cure. Mm. So mm. like there will always be struggles and mm. learning to take what a lot of people call the disability perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to see yourself through that lens of ADHD mm. and accept that and mm. get rid of the self-loathing and like the, the shoulds, I should be able yeah. to do this, yep. you know, that is yep. really counterproductive. Um, mm. so ADHD coaching, just that's their whole goal is like to get people to have system, create systems, and then also like figure out how to love themselves. And that's also for me, like where the trauma work stuff comes into. I see. Yeah. 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 I can certainly see that link. I mean, I'm when I, I'm, I mean, there's in the trauma work that, that I do, you know, there's sort of the neurobiological side of it, which is, you know, helping to, you know, improve the um, ventral vagal nervous system and, you know, and develop, you know, there's that component of things, sort of bottom up approach, um, but but I'm really seeing how uh, in, for example, the internal family systems work that I do, which is a little bit more right. top down work. It's it's taking a look at yeah, what are some, you know, it's the lens of parts, and so it's the yes. part the part that carries shame or the part that feels this way in certain contexts. Um, right. and, and I'm, and I'm, as I hear your examples, I'm already thinking through, um, or my trying really hard, hard part, you know, you know, you know, these are yes. the sort of things that might come up, um, in, in that lens. And so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you're touching upon that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's, and then I did medication of course, um, mm -hmm. and also life changing. So, um, okay. So those two combined. So the coaching plus a better approach to meds or something was yes. those combined was a big deal for you. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like that's one of the most wonderful things about my job is um, regularly my clients tell me you've absolutely saved my life or you've changed my life. Like this is, you know, absolutely life changing. And that is just like, Mm. So fulfilling, you know, like there, I mean, I have clients who are successful litigating attorneys, mm -hmm. you know, like, so like by many respects, like they seem they're like succeeding, they're, yeah. right, but yeah. they are dying inside, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to like, be able to have that piece of the puzzle and they've been trying to figure it out their whole adult lives, you know, they've mm. been like, they've been seeking help and, um, yeah, mm. so Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I wonder if we could hear even sort of from a, like a somewhat practical perspective, you know, for people who are your, um, new, well, let's hear a little bit about your practice. Cause I know you, you have an explicit focus for women and girls. Can you speak to that a little bit? Cause I even, I saw a statistic about that, that outcomes for women and girls is even is likely to be worse. And maybe right. you could just talk about that a little bit and how you, decided then to focus that direction with your practice. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes. So that was another one of the um, statistics that, you know, slapped me in the face right away, along with the um, morbidity and mortality was that mm -hmm. women are three times more likely to be misdiagnosed with a mood disorder okay. or even personality disorder. And, you know, that was my experience um, for sure. And um, right. And it presents differently in women and um, shows up later in girls. Um, boys, you know, historically, their symptoms really start in early childhood um, and okay. often get better in puberty. Whereas mm. girls, 
their symptoms tend to start to show up in puberty, really like late middle school, um, start Mm. of high school. Um, And so, you know, it just became so clear to me that, I mean, women have a much harder time finding a a compassionate, a compassionate listener (laughs) and Mm -hmm. a compassionate approach to what they're struggling with. And that there just is not the expertise out there for women and how to manage um, the hormone transitions, you know, through the month and through the lifespan and how Mm -hmm. that affects ADHD, because there's a lot of um, interplay between estrogen and progesterone and dopamine that we're just Mm -hmm. really starting to learn more about. I'm having to teach myself about it too. Um, and so, you know, and I, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm not a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. So Mm -hmm. when I figured out that I had this issue, I just, like you said, I'm a researcher. I had to know more. And also my children were both diagnosed. And so mm, okay. I was seeking information. Before to, you or after you? Um, they were diagnosed. Oh, geez. I think it was right after me. Right. Okay. Right after me. Okay. I see. Yeah. So it wasn't you. It's a family system. Yes. Um, yep. Yes. And so I was seeking information to try to figure, learn how to help them. You know, and they were both, uh, so my daughter was in middle school and my son was a freshman or sophomore in high school. Okay. And so they were also teenagers and yeah, so I'm seeking all this information to try to figure out how I can help them and got these two certifications and, you know, was like, this is it. This is, this is my life's absolute passion. Mm -hmm. And so I sought positions in, you know, mental health clinics and, you know, the answer was no, because I am a family NP, not a psychiatric NP. And so Mm. I just kind of realized like, okay, if I am going to be able to provide this care to people, which needs to happen, I'm going to have to find out how to do this on my own. And so that's what led me to create Undivided Attention and Mm. led me to focus on women and girls in particular. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Are you, um, with that, is it just sort of an emphasis on women and girls or do you, or with men and boys, do you refer to, or how do you, how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, I do refer boys. Um, I do mm-hmm. see men. Um, mm-hmm. it's more of an emphasis, uh, emphasis on women and girls. Um, okay. I do have a few male clients, um, yeah. But not as ma- not as many men are seeking their care with me because, of course, it says like for women and girls. <laughs> women um, and girls, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I try not to turn men away because, of course, you know they need a compassionate um, listener too. But it's right. much easier for them to get a diagnosis. It just is, and so, I see. and I want to hold space for women. You yeah. know, I don't want my schedule to fill up with you know, somebody who could get a diagnosis more easily somewhere. And then that right. means, you know, I can't, there's a woman out there. Who can't serve as go many. Yeah. Year. Right. Exactly. So, so how does the process work? So, so somebody contacts you, is it, is it often because they, they are, they are suspect, they're wondering if they have ADHD and then if, and then they, they meet with you. And then I guess I'm assuming there are some assessments well, what's sort of the flow that you follow with, with new clients? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so most of them, you know, have kind of been wondering about it on and off. Um, and, you know, and then there's a lot of denial. Like there's a lot of, well, no, that can't be. I, I'm just, I just am a shitty person. I, mm. I don't know. There's no way I have ADHD. I'm a successful attorney. I just mm-hmm. suck. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and then they see a couple more <laughs> TikToks. <laughs> They're right. like, okay, this is just too relatable, right? Um, yep. And then they, you know, start to look for care and start, you know, they've been trying to find answers most of their life. So, um, right. but then they finally get the courage, I think, to reach out. And, you know, maybe they've reached out before. And like I've had a few clients who literally have, you know, said to their primary care doctor, you know, I think I might have ADHD. And mm-hmm. the primary care doctor says, 
well, you've gotten this far in life. What do you want me to do about it? You mm-hmm. know, like. Really um, minim- minim- minimizing what ugh. they're trying to say. Dismissing, minimizing. Yeah. And and that's, that's, you know, a side note, but that's my other passion is to make sure that I educate healthcare providers because I don't think that primary care doctor knows that ADHD reduces life expectancy by 12 to 20 years because she mm-hmm. sure as hell wouldn't say that if they had their blood, if they had, you know, if their right. blood pressure if their, was elevated. If their cholesterol was going through the roof or something. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, geez, yeah. your cholesterol's 600. Well, you've made it you've this made- far. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's a really interesting point about the morbidity. Yeah. Yep. They yep. just don't know. They just honestly, they don't know. But um, yeah, yeah. So they they you know finally get the courage or whatever they find me, however they find me, and mm. um, we I they make an appointment and then I send them some neuropsychological assessments. So they do, I do. It's um a company called Creos C R E Y O S. They're out of Canada actually. They used to be called Cambridge Brain Sciences. But they, um, you know, have, it's objective third party, you know, tests of attention, response inhibition, working memory, um, things Mm -hmm. like that, that just give us that like objective look. And, you know, it's not, it's, there aren't tests of intelligence. Um, Mm -hmm. They're just looking at just those things. Yeah. And then along with that, I have them, you know, we, we also will do the PCL five, which looks at, is there, could there be, um, PTSD? Mm. Um, because PTSD, as you know, creates Mm -hmm. executive function in much very, a very, very, very similar way that ADHD does. And so sometimes, you know, so you have, so, so you, so you're, so in a way you're, so even, so there could be a similar presentation of some executive impairment and you're and so part of your job is to find out uh does this meet the adhd sort of general criterion or could this be from something like ptsd right i see yep yes and probably i would say um maybe maybe something like 30 to 40 percent of the time it's both okay it's okay. both but yeah, so we look at that. We make sure that we are ruling out um, bipolar disorder. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're looking at anxiety and depression and, um, you know, looking at all the functional scales and the rating scales for ADHD. And then yeah. they come in and my evaluation process is designed to be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Okay. Um Basically, we're going to sit down um, for probably somewhere around 180 minutes, you know, not all at one time, but right. and I'm going to go through every possible symptom of ADHD I see. Uh, because you have the, you have the impairments, which are, you know, you, you have organization is impaired. You have um, response inhibition is impaired. You have emotional, dis- you know, regulation is impaired. Well, yep. those are the impairments. Well, what are the symptoms of, of that? Right. And there are, I mean, what, there are, yeah, what are... What are some of them, if you don't mind rattling a couple um, off? Sure. Um, uh, you know, do you um, have a hard time paying attention to a conversation if the TV is on in the room or if the radio is on in the room? Because, you know, if somebody had asked me just, you know, randomly, hey, do you have any trouble paying attention? Mm-hmm. I would have said no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, ha- I have a master's degree. Like, I can pay attention. I, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner. I can pay attention. Right. But, you know, if somebody had said, can you pay attention when the TV's on? I would have said, oh, oh, no, no, <laughs> no that's bad, actually. No, I cannot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. And I mean, there, you know, there were times in my life. So my pre- in my previous life, um, I worked doing home visits and mm. I would work with a team of a nurse and a social worker and we would go into a client's home. Yeah. And some people don't turn off the TV. Uh huh. Right. I don't right. know why, but they don't. And right. that would be extremely challenging for me and honestly, very embarrassing. Uh-huh. I never had an answer to why it would be so difficult for me to be paying attention to what was happening with the team and why we were there. Right. And, you know, asking all the questions and doing the interview and not be pulled to the TV. Yep. Um, 
but so, you know, that's, that's a, for instance, but then there's, you know, like, um, uh, of course, you know, I can't think of any at the moment. Well, I I ask these questions every day, but uh, yes. And that is an example for sure. Like having difficulty, just finding, finding words that you use every day, word finding difficulty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Having difficulty telling a story from beginning to an end without like jumping all over. Oh, well that reminds me of this. Well, wait, did I tell you about this? And, oh, did you remember to, and then, yeah, Mm, you know, um, mm -hmm. Sure. Losing your losing track of thought in the middle of a sentence. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, lots of millions. Yeah, of yeah. Instances. Yeah. And so, so, so in that 180 minutes, you you kind of walk through all of the uh, kind of you look at sort of all of the dimensions that are common uh, with ADHD and and help them understand if that applies to them. Is that sort of what that phase is yes. like? Exactly. So it's a process of highlighting for them, like all the things that they thought made them a bad mother, a bad student, a bad partner, a bad friend, um, just Mm -hmm. a bad person in general. Um, The Mm -hmm. things that they, you know, have been accused of being lazy about or rude or Mm -hmm. um, too sensitive. Um, I go through and ask all these questions and it is... A reminder like, oh, okay, so these aren't things that make me a terrible person. These are symptoms of a neurodevelopmental disability. Mm. And so it's trying to set the stage to allow them to start the process of self-acceptance and start Mm. seeing themselves through that disability lens and have that realistic perspective that like, Yes, it is life-changing. Getting your diagnosis Mm -hmm. is life-changing. There's no question Mm -hmm. about it, but Mm -hmm. it is not a cure. We cannot then make you neurotypical and like remove all of your challenges because they will still be there. Um, Right. But yeah, so that's what that process is. It's, It's diving into every symptom. And then in the second half, it's more like doing more of the educational piece of like, Okay, well, mm. this is this is why that's happening. This is why you're having trouble not just pushing that person aside when they're fiddling with the key in the door, and ju- you have mm. to just do it for yourself. Mm. That's why that's happening, and this is you know taking mm. that building in pauses and things like that. So, yeah, mm. that's the process, and then I give them a workbook that continues the process of learning what is happening in your brain, and then yeah. And is so in that, you know, I remember you mentioning that in our, in our other call. So is that, is that self-paced? Is that just sort of something that they do on their own or sort of with check-ins with you or how how does that operate? Yeah. I mean, it's self-paced partly because like, it's a lot to digest and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a coach. I don't have coach training. So, you know, I I don't profess to be a coach. um, Right. And I don't, you know, address it in that structure. I encourage people to work with a coach if they want to. I do, you know, offer different levels of service. You know, that's why I don't take insurance. I don't take insurance because then I can see fewer clients and really tailor the services to what the person needs. So for instance, I see. If I have somebody who needs a daily check-in for a little while because they are just really struggling with how to fine-tune their medications, then we do that, you know? But yeah, yeah, the workbook is, it's self, it's self-guided. I, Mm -hmm. I have a lot of it recorded on my website as well. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about doing um, a group therapy program that would Mm -hmm. be structured. um, Yep, yep. Yeah. So, but yeah. that's kind of what we do. Yeah. Interesting. And so you, and so are you, you, you're, you're able to give the form after all those assessments, you know, with your licensing and whatnot, you can give a, a diagnosis. Is is that correct? Yes. That's a, yes. I can diagnose ADHD. Um, and then I can also diagnose PTSD. I could diagnose depression and anxiety. Um, yeah. I don't feel quite as confident about bipolar, but I know that if it's like looking more like bipolar, then I'm going to refer them out anyway. Um, 
Right. But yes, I can diagnose. And as a nurse practitioner, I can prescribe medication too. So. Yeah, that was my next question. So, so, so you can also be part, you can be um, getting somebody started on the um, medicine. Well, for your clients, is that sort of, is it most people that there's a, that there's going to be a, a pharmaceutical component or, or uh, it could go either way? What, what, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it's most people. Um, yeah. We were, were talking earlier about Gabramate's work and about are we just, you know, over treating everybody with stimulants. And that's that's a myth, too, about mm -hmm. that, that stimulants mm -hmm. are over prescribed. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that um, ADHD is the most well researched mental disorder that there is, um, remarkably, even though there is a vast amount of disinformation and misinformation in the public. It's the most well researched. Yeah. And stimulants are the most well-researched psychotropic drug we have ever had. Okay. Um, they've been treating, uh, you know, hyperactivity and attention disorders since the 1930s with stimulant okay. medications. Yep. And they're also the most effective psychoactive mm. drug we have okay. um, right now. Right. Um, you know, the psychedelics might be kind of like coming something, into some, play to something we'll magic. learn about in 10 yes. years. Yeah. 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 But, um, but yeah, stimulants are the first line treatment for ADHD okay. and yeah. that is regardless of age. And that's okay. been demonstrated over and over and over again in the research and in the studies that behavioral programs work as long as they are implemented. Mm. But, and this is where, this is the struggle I think that a lot of people hit is, um, you know, it's not a skills deficit. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's executive dysfunction that you can't teach it away. Right. And even schools are not that great at understanding that yet. Yeah. You know, they the IEPs will have like the goal of like, well, we'll be able to do this independently and right. Right. No, won't be able to. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But what you'll you can't do it independently. And then you'll, and so you'll, by knowing that you can, you can plan a different way of handling it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah so most people, um, you know, I mean, they've, they've tried every other medication on the block, so they're ready to try a stimulant by the time they find me. Right. Um, and I would say the statistics, um, pretty, pretty well pan out in my practice. 80% of people have a stimulant first yeah. dose, they titrate to the dose and they're like, this is it. This has changed my life. And then there's maybe 10% who it's like, well, maybe that first one wasn't quite right. Maybe let's try, mm -hmm. let's try another one. Mm -hmm. And then there's a final 10% who were really struggle to find the right medications. And so I for see. some people, it can take about a year to find the okay. right medication, the right dose, the right timing. I see. I see. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder, so I guess kind of a last topic that would be interesting for me because it intersects with, with my work specializing so much in nervous system regulation. Um, and, you know, like a few of the, you know, one way I think about um, our practice is most of our work is what I would call polyvagally informed or informed by the polyvagal theory, which is Stephen Porges's model of the autonomic nervous system and looking at our sort of we have optimal autonomic regulation when we're in what's called the social engagement or the ventral vagal nervous system. And that's sort of we have a good heart rate variability when we're in that state. We have high vagal tone, all that sort of things. And then for various reasons, trauma, stress, maybe even, maybe even genetic or epigenetic, for various reasons, we might be utilizing um, more of, a, of stress physiology more often than, we, than is helpful. Like we might be sort of chronically in a fight or flight, sympathetic sort of aspect of our autonomic nervous system, or we might be chronically in a uh, freeze, uh, immobilization, withdrawal, sometimes correlated with depression, uh, we might, so it's like <clears throat> for various reasons, again, trauma, um, stress, burnout, um, and, and possibly even genetic and epigenetic, we might not, we, or we might be um, having less access to the social engagement nervous system as 
would be nice in terms of our uh, physiological regulation and even our emotional regulation and things like that. So, so I'm and so I before this interview, I just was just doing a little bit of research around um, can polyvagal approaches that are designed that are meant to boost you know support the vagus nerve uh and the things in our practice we use are things like tre that's tension and trauma releasing exercise which is a shaking practice uh, we use somatic experiencing which is a sort of like a mindfulness approach it's talk based but it's helping somebody learn to sense and feel um, interoceptively what's ha what what's happening in their sensations their breath and and by gaining more self-awareness they can start to navigate their own internal autonomic experience a little bit more clearly mm -hmm. and then another one is the um, designed by Stephen Porges himself the safe and sound listening protocol which is a music therapy that I'm not mm -hmm. going to get into all the theory but it 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 stimulates the muscles of the middle middle ear muscles and you know and 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 strengthens vagal activity. So there's just different ways basically of of improving vagal tone. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, so some of the things I've been looking at suggest that you know not as a certain like you say none of these things are cures for ADHD, but they might be things that are supportive or helpful. And I'm wondering if you have any experience either personally or with your clients around uh, the benefit of attending to the autonomic nervous system. Does that, does that have a, a, a place in a holistic approach to ADHD treatment? Yes, I believe it absolutely does. Um, even in those who, you know, don't, don't have PTSD, but just ADHD alone, um, there's something called rejection sensitivity dysphoria, okay. where, you know, that's, that's not like an official diagnosis in the DSM, but it's, it's a, maybe we'll call it a syndrome um, mm. that a huge portion of eight people with ADHD experience. And basically, it has to do with what we were talking about earlier, where, you know, the, the sympathetic nervous system maybe is just kind of primed because um, kids with ADHD experience something on the order of six times the amount of negative feedback um, of their peers by age 12. And ah, that continues throughout their life. Um, yep. People with ADHD receive a lot of negative feedback in their social lives across mm. all realms of their lives, across mm. their relationships, academic, occupational, financial, mm. yep. you know, legal, all of it. Mm. And so, yes, working on sympathetic tone to help with the rejection sensitivity, which is triggering the parasites, triggering fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by any real or perceived criticism. Threat. Oh, criticism. Right. Yep. yep. Criticism. Yep. Yeah. Right. Emotional yep. threat. Yeah. Um, and that is a, that's a huge issue in ADHD. And often it can lead to things like for some people, it will lead to perfectionism, mm -hmm. um, right. which then leads to paralysis. Because if you can't do the thing right that you need to turn in at work, don't do it. Don't do it at all. Don't yep. do it at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So um, I'm a huge proponent of um, nervous system regulation and rewiring the nervous system. And I don't know how to do it very well, which is for sure why I reached out to you guys and why I love having you guys as a resource to be able to provide to my clients like, okay, you know, you know, there are medications that we even can try to use for rejection sure. sensitive dysphoria, but they have yep, a lot of yep. side effects. Yep. And, um, you know, they're just blood pressure medications that, you know, help with the norepinephrine output from the I um, see. Interesting. system. Yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, doing the work, doing, doing the breath work and working on the vagal tone and all of yeah. that. I see it just as a holistic approach, a 360 degree um, approach as a part of that for for living your life with ADHD, with living with a disability. Got it. And a chronic chronic disorder. Yeah, wonderful. 
Um, I'm trying to think what we haven't touched on. This, no, this, to me, I'm I'm feeling uh, satisfied. I, I have a clear picture of um, the people that you're serving and how. Um, we have, what have we missed? What else would be good just in terms of information or resources? I'll, of course, include, you know, your website and anything we've discussed will will be linked in the show notes here. But any anything we should any, any other resources do you think that we we should um, bring into the conversation? Well, I mean, attitudemag.com is mm. a an absolutely wonderful resource for any and all things neurodivergence. Um, mm. You know, ADHD is just one aspect of neurodivergence and often it does not it does not live alone. It has friends most of the time <laughs> such mm. as um, autism or giftedness. Giftedness is even a neurodivergence, um, hmm. you know, and then of course the mental, the mental health things that come along with it and the, you know, the, um, the stress work, the parts work, all of that. You can find tons of information about that on attitudemag.com. Oh, um, and I think Chad, chad.org is a great, uh, another resource, free resource. Um, for finding information for people, you know, you can go there to do like a provider um, search and you can, mm -hmm. you know, find providers in your area who specialize in ADHD because um, really you do need to find someone who specializes, you know, in it to right. have somebody who's going to be compassionate and understands and provides good care. Right. Wonderful. Well, so cool. I mean, to me that there's something very empowering to think about well, actually, just, you know, your own personal story, this idea that information um, uh, can then can then provide a foundation from which to cultivate, you know, certainly understanding oneself better, uh, healing some of those, you know, the shame and the and, and you know, developing more self-compassion for the for the neurodivergence that you have in, in you know, your, the strengths and deficits or, or, or that come along with that potentially. Um, but, uh, but no, it feels very optimistic knowing that there's somebody who know, knows there's a problem firsthand and said, you know, there needs to be more of this. And so, you know, uh, jumped in and, and just uh, forging ahead with a with a practice focused in this way. So I'm I'm super glad to know just about that work you're doing in Madison. Um, and yeah, and and uh, feel really encouraged hear, hearing everything here today. Well, likewise, Alex. Um, you know, you've kind of done the same thing, forging your own path in in a kind of you know the third wave of therapies for mm -hmm. recognizing and dealing with trauma and, and dealing with the nervous system and parts work and internal family systems. So yay. <laughs> yay. Yay us. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, good. Well, Kelly, let's land here and then, Hey, let's, let's tee up a future conversation about Janina Fisher's work and, and okay. shame. Cause that would Sounds be, good. that would be super interesting as well. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, I, Alex. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. To learn more, visit us at redbeardsomatictherapy.com or send me an email at alex at redbeardsomatictherapy.com. If today's conversation resonated with you, help spread the word by subscribing and sharing with others. Hope to see you next time.